one of the scariest, uh, most nerve-wracking things that I have ever done happened at the end of every semester when I was in my undergraduate uh, degree at my school of music. Uh, we had these things called juries. I don't know if uh, some of you who are, got one, two, three, boom. Th some people know what juries are. Great. Uh, for those of you who don't know what juries are, they are some of the most nerve-wracking moments of an 18 to 22 year old's life uh, because they are basically the capstone performance at the end of every semester. You're supposed to uh, prepare uh, multiple pieces that you perform in front of your professors for your department as well as whatever uh, techniques you're kind of learning for that semester. They were going to ask you, grill you, you know, you don't know what they're going to ask and so you have to be prepared to play pretty much anything that they ask. Uh, and it was nerve-wracking uh, because you're doing it alone. And for me, uh, the school of music that my wife and I went to uh, when we were in college, uh, the department heads of our department, the woodwind sections, were some of the top players on the planet. <laughs> so you have the top musicians on the planet judging you, grading you for your performance all alone. And if you guys know anything about me, I hate to be alone. Uh, and that's why I was never a very good solo performance artist, because it, it's just me, right? And I hate to be alone. I always felt more comfortable in an ensemble. Um, and so it was just absolutely the most terrifying thing. I had, like, panic attacks. I couldn't help stop shaking. I was trying all my breathing exercising. Nothing actually helped to work to get me to calm down to actually play. Now, by God's grace, I did well in the juries, but still, it was super nerve-wracking. However, there was a couple of semesters where um, the TA that was actually instructing me for my private instructions every week, uh, they're usually doctoral students uh, who are kind of teaching the undergraduates, uh, was allowed to be with me in my jury. So all the, all the main professors and then my TA, who I had gotten to know, uh, who were really on my team. Those are the times that I felt like I performed the best because I had someone who was with me. There's a sense of solidarity that she was there or he was there with me in my jury uh, to support me. And it gave me a lot of strength and a lot of courage uh, to know that, you know what? I can do this. We can do this. And this is kind of the idea that the writer now begins to turn his attention to in the book of Hebrews to Christ's solidarity with his people. Uh, remember, chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2 the writer has really been describing the exaltation of God's Son, uh, really describing the beauty, the glory of God's Son being the creator, the sustainer, uh, the purifier, the inheritor of all things, all of cosmic history. He's superior to the angels. He's superior in his kingdom. He's superior in his salvation. Everything about him is supreme in all aspects of his being. It really focuses on his divinity. And then, in, starting in chapter 2, the writer begins to turn his attention now to the incarnation of God's Son uh, as human. He's both fully divine as well as fully human. And begins to really focus on the implications of Christ's humanness and why it's necessary, not just for salvation, but I think for the ongoing encouragement uh, and sanctification and really the preserva uh, preservation of the saints that Christ was fully human and experienced all that we do, yet was without sin. And there's three ways uh, that uh, really the writer in this kind of next, so this week and next week are kind of a two-parter, uh, little uh, mini, mini, mini series. Uh, and there's really three things that the writer of Hebrews begins to really unpack for us in terms of what the incarnation is and what that means for us in terms of our salvation. We'll take a look at Jesus as our forerunner. We see Jesus in fraternity and Jesus as the freedom giver. Uh, and these are kind of the three aspects uh, of Jesus' incarnation that the writer now turns his attention to. And the big idea for these next two weeks is that Christ's solidarity with his people is the most liberating, comforting, strengthening, and glorious aspects of his ministry and our lives. Christ's solidarity with his people, his with us-ness, is one of the most glorious, strengthening, comforting, strengthening uh, aspects of his ministry in our lives. So if you guys will go ahead and stand with me in honor of reading God's word. This is Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. I'll read it, declare it to be God's word. We'll thank him for it together. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source— 
That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Always starting with uh, Jesus as the forerunner. Uh, and really, verse 10 could be a sermon all on its own. I mean, there's so many, I mean, just that, that first verse is just so packed with so many wonderful truths about Christ. It really could be its own sermon, but I don't want to be here for the next three years preaching through Hebrews, so we'll just kind of, I'll try to my best to sort of summarize the grandeur of verse 10. Uh, And the the thing that kind of, I think, initially jumps out to us is sort of this reiteration of the the, the divinity of of Jesus. Remember, in verse 9, the writer had just spoken Jesus' name for the very first time in the letter. Up until that point, it was always God's Son, God's Son, God's Son, the Son of God, God's Son. Who is this person? The big reveal is like, well, it's Jesus. And he is the one by whom and for whom all things exist, reiterating the divinity of Christ, the godness of this Jesus. And especially when putting it in context of this salvation that we who are the elect of God are going to inherit, the writer is emphasizing the God-sized salvation that this is. Really emphasizing the God-sized salvation that this is. Now, this is not incongruent or somehow incompatible with the character of God and the character of God's Son. I mean, we see these really big epic things about Jesus, about God's Son, uh, and now we have these really kind of almost scandalous declarations of the writer that he became a person and he suffered and died. God, in the form of his Son, became a human, suffered, and died. What kind of a God is that? You know, the writer is kind of anticipating some of the fears, the reactions that the church would have heard. Is like, wait, wait, wait. We're cool with chapter one. We're cool with God being the creator and the sustainer of all things. But the fact that he would actually become a person and then suffer and then die, what kind of a God is that? How is this, how does this like mesh with his sovereignty, his almightiness, his holiness? And the writer uses a word to describe why It's the word founder, that he would be the founder of their salvation. Now, that word founder is an okay translation in in our English ESV. Uh, A better word would be the word pioneer or forerunner. And as all preachers like to alliterate, I just went with the other forerunner. So forerunner, fraternity, and freedom. These are the three F words, not those F words, uh, that we're going to be focusing on. But the writer is really emphasizing not only is it not incongruent, with God's character, that he would send his son to suffer and die for his people, but it it is exactly in line with his character. It's exactly in line with the character of the sovereign, loving, and holy God that he would do this, that uh, Jesus, the Savior, the Redeemer, would taste death for all of his people. Even Jesus talks about this in Luke 24. Speaking to his disciples, he says, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Now, this is, of course, post-resurrection that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. You know, as they are seeing the resurrected Christ, he is interpreting that whole idea, saying it was necessary for the Christ to suffer all that he did. All that I did was part of the necessity of securing salvation for us. It's a God-sized salvation because it was a God-sized problem. The offense of sin, which mankind had been under since Adam and Eve, was so great. It was so deeply embedded to the very root of, the very core of our nature, that only God could eradicate it. Only God could actually get it out. And in sending his son, he was showing his sovereign nature over this whole plan of redemption. It was not an accident that sin entered into the world. It wasn't an accident. God wasn't somehow responding to this weird thing that he didn't foresee happening. In fact, God purposed that sin would be part of this plan of redemption. He purposed it. He allowed it. So that his glory as the Redeemer, as merciful, of gracious, compassionate, loving, would be on full display. He allowed it so that his nature as holy and judge, righteous and powerful, would also be on display. Paul speaks about this in Romans 9. He says, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Now, that's a 
really intense couple of verses there to just dump on you. But suffice it to say, the point of these two verses, at the very least, is to show that sin was not an accident that God was trying to figure out what to do with. It was purposed, it was allowed so that his glory and his character would be on full display for us to worship and be in awe of. It took God to get rid of sin in the form of his son. God, his creation, he spoke with just a word. But in his salvation, in the sending of his son, in the form of man, to suffer and die on behalf of all of his elect, in this salvation, the word of God became flesh and labored to secure it. Redemption, in many ways, is superior to creation because the labor of which God exercised to secure it for his people. It took one word to create. It took 33 years for Jesus to redeem and to save his people. It's so much more superior in that. So the suffering and the salvation together, they're not incompatible with his character. It's exactly the kind of, almost the crowning jewel of his character that we see in the Son. But also, in verse 10, we see that suffering makes complete. At the end, uh, that the founder of their salvation will be perfect through suffering. That word perfect uh, is not uh, the idea of perfection, we think of moral perfection, that there was something lacking in Christ's character, or there's something there that needed to be removed. That's not the word itself. The word is the idea of complete. Uh, in the Greek, the word telos is the root word. It's the idea of purpose. You know, we, any of you have taken our Theo 101 class, which most of you has, we talk about the teleological argument, the design, the purpose for which we see everything kind of ordered rightly. Uh, this is the exact same kind of word, it's a longer word in the Greek anyway, uh, for the word complete. That Jesus and his role as the forerunner, the captain, the pioneer for his people, that role could only be completed through suffering. Now, the writer doesn't exactly tell us yet what kind of sufferings Jesus went through. It's not specific. It's a very general term for suffering. But I think suffice it to say that the human experience is, generally speaking, one of suffering <laughs> of a lot of different kinds, uh, you know. And uh, we, you don't have to elaborate on that. We know exactly what that means, what that feels like. And Jesus experienced all of it, everything. If Jesus had not experienced any sufferings, then his role as the forerunner of our salvation and of this eternal life and of the glory that is ours in him, it would not have been complete, for he would not have known and really lived what it is to be a human. He would not have been able to actually represent us and be a substitute for us on the cross. We wouldn't have experienced anything about humanity. And suffering, and we'll touch on this uh, a lot more next week, uh, but suffering does not mean that Jesus sinned. Okay, suffering is not like a punishment that God sends for sin, kind of like what Job's friends, if you guys know the book of Job, kind of falsely asserted. It's like, well, what sin did you do? You know, Suffering is not a punishment for sin. However, Suffering is a result of sin, generally speaking, the corruption that comes because of, of sin. Now, we've all experienced suffering that often does not come from any fault of our own. But what we do with our suffering really shows us where our hearts are at. Right? It shows us where our allegiance is at. It shows us where our trust is at, our ultimate hope and comfort really truly lies. Either for us, we'll either turn to the Lord for help and comfort during our suffering or we'll become upset about it. We might rail against it, just trying to get rid of it because suffering is uncomfortable. I just want to be as comfortable in my life as possible. I'm trying to get rid of it rather than see, really, this is kind of an opportunity for trusting the Lord. And I think that suffering is oftentimes an invitation for deeper relationship and deeper trust in the Lord. And Jesus certainly uh, demonstrated this often in his ministry. I mean, think about, uh, you know, at the garden, when he was praying to the Father, Father, let this cup pass from me, not my will, but yours be done. I mean, that's entering into a very unique way of experiencing suffering in the human experience and connecting that to trust of the Father, submitting to the Father's will. And Jesus' suffering means that there's a deeper purpose to suffering. If there was no God, then suffering is meaningless. And the goal of life should absolutely be to remove as much suffering as possible and be as comfortable as possible. But there is a God. There is a God, and he has a son. His name is Jesus, and he suffered all that we suffer and did it perfectly. Suffering has 
meaning and purpose in our lives. It's not trivial. It's not meaningless. But it's, a, it's extremely important for God to really continue to form us and shape us as his children. Suffering also brings glory. Right? That's the, the third aspect of just that one verse. I told you this one verse could be a whole sermon. I mean, I'll just close my Bible and we'll be done here in a minute, right? But i got a lot more to say, so buckle in. Uh, it's important that this suffering, he would bring many sons to glory. Many sons to glory. I mean, suffering does bring glory, right? No pain, no gain. I mean, that's a super popular saying. Uh, we see that the suffering of Christ brings glory to the Father, and how we endure suffering also can bring glory to the Father. One of the sufferings that uh, Jesus endured uh, was a lot of relational stuff. I mean, think about his betrayal. A guy that lived with him for multiple years, was close to him every single day of his life, betrayed Jesus. To be betrayed by a close friend is heart-wrenching. It's devastating. I've been betrayed in my own life. I know some of you have as well. Some of us have experienced that kind of suffering in our lives. It is, in some ways, very comforting to know that Jesus has gone through that same kind of exact suffering we feel. But here's how Jesus responded and how it brought glory to the Father. We have this recorded for us in John 13. When he had gone out, meaning Judas Iscariot, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify in himself and glorify him at once. And the suffering of knowing that his close friend with whom he had broken bread is now betraying him and literally going to the religious leaders to, for a paltry sum to betray his friend, that somehow brings glory to the Father. How does it bring glory to the Father? Don't always know all that. We may not always know uh, in this life yet how all of our suffering brings glory to the Father. We will one day. But consider John 16. Uh, at the end of uh, chapter 16, the very first part of 17, uh, we have this, what Jesus describes, uh, glory to the Father comes through suffering. And this comes right after Jesus had predicted that the world would hate the disciples and want to kill them because the world hated Jesus first, wanted to kill him. He said, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Suffering brings many sons to glory, and to the glory of the Son. Another way in which uh, Jesus suffered on behalf of his people is in securing forgiveness for sin. Um, we have our leadership development cohort. We're going through uh, one of the books that we're going through. One of the three books we're going through is called The Reason for God by Tim Keller. And in that, uh, Tim Keller describes, gives a really great definition for forgiveness and how it's kind of uh, really attached to this idea of suffering. I don't know if you guys have ever thought about the relationship between forgiveness and suffering, but here's what he says. Forgiveness means refusing to make them pay for what they did. However, to refrain from lashing out at someone when you want to do so with all your being is agony. You're absorbing the debt, taking the cost of it completely on yourself instead of taking it out on the other person. It hurts terribly. Many people would say it feels like a kind of death. Forgiveness is not easy. Forgiveness really takes the Son of God to help us be able to do this rightly. And this is what God does in Christ in forgiving our sins. Instead of taking his wrath out on his people, he does so on the perfect substitute and representative, Jesus Christ. And this is yet uh, another aspect of Christ's solidarity with us as our big brother. is that he takes our place, bearing the punishment for our sin, so that we would be free to enter the glory as his adopted sons and daughters. And this is how Jesus is the forerunner of our salvation, making clear, making the path clear and easy to see to get to true life. As I was uh, doing my study for this, I kept thinking about my own experience of hiking in the deserts of Phoenix. Uh, my dad would take us all out, uh, similar to the Velez family. There were six kids in my family um, and five boys and a girl, actually almost identically to that, uh, to the Velez family. And uh, so my dad would take, you know, the boys out because we just, you know, had tons of energy and just every weekend let's go hiking because, you know, get your energy out. And when we were young, my dad would, would lead the way. He would go ahead of us and he would wear this super bright orange, like neon orange ball cap 
But this was like after a long time after neon was a really cool color, you know. So you're like, oh, that's my dad. Yep. And I've got my silly hat I wear now, so I'm following my dad's footsteps. But it was great because my dad would go ahead of us on these trails that are hot. They were dusty. He was experiencing the same kind of suffering we would as kids of like, ah, it's so hot. I got no water. I'm getting scratched by the cactus. Well, yeah, my dad was there before us. You know, he led the way ahead of us, making it clear for us to be able to see where to go. This is the image I kept having in my mind of, of what Jesus does for us in clearing the way for salvation and life as the forerunner of us, his people. The question I want us to kind of ponder is, are we living a life that is worthy of this forerunner? Are we living a life that is following after the great pioneer and captain of our salvation? Are we seeing suffering in our life, in all its forms, as an invitation for deeper trust and relationship? Are we seeking to forgive others the way that God and Christ has forgiven us? Well, let's move on to the next uh, aspect of his solidarity with us, which is Jesus in fraternity. Not in a fraternity, but in fraternity in brotherhood with us. We see this in verse 11 to 13 of Hebrews chapter 2. I think first, I just want to kind of draw attention to that phrase that the writer gives, that he is not ashamed to call us brothers. And the phrase there in the, in the Greek is brothers and sisters. So it's not just a masculine thing here. Uh, but he's not ashamed to call us his siblings. He's not afraid to call us his little brothers and sisters. And I think that this is one of the most, I think, beautiful declarations of Christ's solidarity is that he proudly calls us his siblings. We, (laughs) you and me, we know how sinful we are. We know how wretched we are. We know how blind and poor we are. And yet, God, the creator, the sustainer, the redeemer, the purifier of his people, the one who goes ahead of us, suffers on our behalf and dies and gives us new life and his resurrected life, he is not ashamed to call you his brother or his sister. In fact, he's proud of that. Being the oldest of six siblings, I definitely acutely aware uh, that being called another person's brother or sister, uh, the kind of the power that that has over the siblings. There's kind of this kind of collective like honor shame thing going on, right? When one sibling does really well in something, it's kind of like we all sort of shared in that. When one did something really dumb, like I usually did, uh, the family, you know, would kind of feel that, right? Brothers and the sisters would be like, that's ah, best. Yeah, that's my older brother over there. Yep. Uh, I was thinking, this is story time with Pastor Bus uh, this week. Uh, it's, you know, brotherhood it brings up all these stories. One of the times that my brothers were like, the most ashamed to call me their big brother was in high school, classic, right? And um, I had friends, we, did, we got into a lot of shenanigans uh, together. And I use that term, that like nice term for it. We were just really dumb and just did a lot of really dumb things. And so we were in the youth group. Uh, we were at the, like the youth camp. You know, we were all there in this together. And my friends and I, I don't know what like prompted us to do this. Uh, again, we're just dumb 17-year-olds. Decided to take the fire extinguishers and like start spraying each other with the fire extinguishers. We had like this fire extinguisher war. Now, not every 17-year-old is dumb. I'm just clarifying that. We, I was. I'm just... It was me. <laughs> I know a lot of very wise 17-year-olds. Uh, and uh, we started spraying each other with fire extinguisher. I don't know why we did this. We thought it was fun, I guess. Uh, but, of course, we got in trouble. Why would we not get in trouble for this? And, and so in order to, like, sort of make us pay for this, because I didn't have any money, the youth director trooped us all out in front of the youth group. There's probably about 100 of us in the youth group. Uh, before breakfast, in front of the big hall, and kind of, you know, sh- publicly shamed us in front of everybody. And as punishment, before we could go eat breakfast, they had us eat wet dog food. So I had to eat wet dog food in front of everybody before I could go and have breakfast. And then my friend couldn't finish it, so I finished his. <laughs> Needless to say, my brothers were not exactly proud to call uh, me their, his big brother. But this is not Jesus. <laughs> we are not ashamed of Christ. And he is actually not ashamed of us, even though we do uh, dumb things all the time in our life. But what, there's an interesting phrase that the writer uses here, uh, which is that he who sanctifies, of course, meaning God and Christ, and he who are sanctified, meaning us, all have one source, or uh, another way to understand, all are one. So he is exactly one 
with us. And there's at least three ways that we are at one with our big brother Jesus. One, in nature, that he was fully human. He experienced all that we do, lived the perfect human life. He suffered as we suffered and did it without sin. The very first quotation that we have here uh, in chapter 2 for this little section is actually from Psalm 22. Okay, so some of you who are familiar with, uh, you know, some of the Gospels understand that when Jesus was on the cross, what is it that he cried out to God? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All you Bible scholars know that is Psalm 22, verse 1. So Jesus is basically saying this experience right here, this Psalm 22, it was very well known by the Hebrews. It's all about Jesus. It's pointing to him. And if you guys read Psalm 22, there is a lot of suffering that happens in that psalm. And yet also these great declarations of hope and trust that the sufferer has in the Lord and in his salvation. Jesus is the perfect sufferer who perfectly trusts the Father. And as he lived, so we also live in him. So consider these uh, verses from Psalm 22, verses 16 through 18. They might sound really familiar to the scene of the cross. The writer says, For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. I mean, that is Jesus, right? That's exactly the scene there. But there's a turning point in Psalm 22. And it's right here where the writer is quoting Psalm 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. There's a turning point in the psalm where the writer of the psalm, the sufferer in the psalm, experiences the salvation and new life of God. And what is the very first thing he does in the psalm is to sing the praises with his brothers in the congregation. He's one with us in nature. Jesus has suffered as we suffered. He has trusted the Father as we learn to trust the Father. And he's with us in this, strengthening us to be able to do this. He's also one with us in representation. Uh, The next two verses uh, in our little passage here are uh, from Isaiah chapter 8. It's a little bit more of an obscure uh, passage. But really, Isaiah chapter 8 describes the elect of God. He he uses the word remnant. It's kind of like an Old Testament Uh, idea for the elect of God. And he's really comparing and contrasting uh, the hardened hearts of Israel who rejected God, which most most of Israel rejected God uh, and didn't live for him, worshipped other idols, uh, wanted to be like the other nations. Yet there was still this remnant within Israel uh, who actually did love God. And Isaiah often is prophesying to this remnant who would continue to trust the Lord and hold fast to him in the midst of not just a nation that was running away from God, but the nations that wanted to oppress Israel. Isaiah's life was a living representation of this faithful remnant who are the true children of God. And uh, I'm going to give, this is going to be like, this is like super deep nerd stuff. So you get some good stories and some super deep nerd stuff. So uh, three names that really capture uh, this representative nature of Christ. First, Isaiah's name. And I'll connect this to chapter 8 from the Old Testament where this is from in a a moment. Um, Isaiah's name means Yahweh is salvation. Not just that Yahweh gives salvation or somehow makes a way for it to happen, but he himself is salvation. He himself is salvation for his people. It's really important to understanding. We'll connect that to Christ in a moment. Isaiah had two sons, which is why we have uh, this second quotation, Behold, I and the children God has given me. This is Isaiah speaking of himself and his two boys, his two sons. Uh, Now these uh, two sons, their names are really important for understanding the work of God and his people. The first is Meher Shalal Hashbaz. I just call him Baz for short, right? It's kind of a weird name, right? Uh, But really the name simply means God's speedy removal of the enemies of his people. The speedy removal of the enemies of his people is a promise that God was given to his people. The second son was Shir Yashub. It means a remnant shall return. A remnant shall return. So these are the three uh, names that are being really uh, focused on and highlighted in Isaiah chapter 8. That the writer is quoting from here as talking about Jesus. So let's put them together because now with these three uh, representatives, 
we have this gospel being put together. God himself is the salvation of his people through the speedy removal of their enemies and preserving them through the trials until they're united with him after death. This is when we put all these three things together. We see, of course, that this, of course, is accomplished through our representative, Jesus, whose name means he will save his people from their sins, or Yahweh is salvation. That's what Jesus' name means. So rightly, I think, did the writer of Hebrews understand the representative nature of Christ for his people. Like we mentioned last week, this is good. Because just as in one man's life, Adam, who was the representative of all humankind, fell and brought death to all of us, so one man's obedience in Christ, the second Adam, brings justification for many. You can kind of think of it, whatever Jesus did in the past, he did for us now, because we are all one. If he kept the law, we kept the law in him. If he died, we reckon that he di we died in him. We live because he now lives and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We're also one in interests, right? His concerns become our concerns. His goals become our goals. His vision becomes our vision. His kingdom becomes our kingdom. Um, consider how younger siblings always love to copy their older siblings, right? I mean, it's as inevitable as the sunrise. The younger siblings will always want to copy and do the things that their older siblings do. It's kind of a fact of life. And it's actually pretty fun sometimes to watch. Uh, I know that uh, Azure and Malachi right now, man, they're just like two little peas in a pod. Malachi, 18 months, running around, just copying everything that Azure does. Literally everything he does, like, Azure could do no wrong, you know. And so it's actually a lot of fun to, like, watch them, you know, kind of pal around and get into trouble and play games and do all kinds of stuff. It's a lot of fun. And Azure loves Malachi. I mean, he just absolutely adores Malachi. He'll just, like, tackle him, saying, I love you, you know, giving him hugs and kisses. And I just love the way that he invites Malachi often uh, to play in their games. Uh, he's a much better older brother than I was. So be like Azure. Don't be like me as an older brother. But Jesus, as the older brother, is the one that we are seeking to imitate in our life. Right? He's the one whose life we are seeking to imitate now as we follow him as our pioneer and forerunner. We want to live the best kind of life now. Look at our big brother Jesus to see how he loved people, how he loved and trusted the Father, how he spoke God's word. He lived a life of prayer and dependence on the Father. He loved anyone and served everyone around him. He cultivated rich relationships, and these people went on to continue the work that he started. He suffered and died for his friends and his brothers. This is the kind of brother that we all want and need in our lives. We have one like that in Christ. But as we think about the idea of siblings, you cannot also uh, talk about siblings without thinking about parents, right? Uh, kind of the, the parental lineage. And Jesus speaks about uh, parenting. Uh, I'm not gonna, it's not a parenting seminar, but right now the aspect of uh, kind of the parents that I want to focus on is the idea of fatherhood. Jesus teaches that we all have one of two fathers. Either we have God as our father or we have the devil as our father. Those are your two options. Either you have God as your father, or you have Satan as your father. And this is what Jesus says in John chapter 8. I mean, he is a very scathing rebuke to the religious leaders. They're looking to try to kill Jesus. They almost got him. And then Jesus rebukes them this way. He says, I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. They answered him, well, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you'd be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You were doing the works of your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of the father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar, the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. See, these Jews had put a lot of stock in the parental lineage, kind of the parental lineage linked to Abraham, who was considered and counted as righteous because of his faith. And we'll take a look a lot, of, a lot about that a lot more next week, the offspring of Abraham. 
But Jesus here in this passage is literally saying it doesn't matter what your earthly lineage is. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how much privilege or lack of privilege you had in your life. None of it matters to make you either God or the devil, except for where your heart is in faith. That shows whose you are. It shows whose you are. All who hear the words of Christ and love him show that they are children of the Father. They are the family line of Christ. And he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Children will always live out the values of the family. Always. Right? That's why it says, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he was old, he shall not depart from it. Right? Because they will always, no matter how hard they try to you know, not live out the values of the family, whatever they are, they ultimately will. And if we are of Christ, or the Father in heaven, we will seek to live out those family values. So where is your hope in life? Where is your ultimate security in life? Who are you seeking to live your life for ultimately? Are you living out the family values that have been pioneered and made a way for us in Christ? Do you call Jesus brother today? He is a perfect older brother who loves and cares for his little siblings, his little brothers and sisters with tenderness and grace of compassion and solidarity. He's not ashamed of our sin or our brokenness or our weakness. Instead, he helps us in our weakness. He cleanses us of our sin. He heals our broken hearts so that we might live more freely to glorify him in our lives. Let's pray. Holy Father, you have freely given your son. O divine son, you have freely paid our debt. Eternal Spirit, you have freely bid us come to you. Triune God, you have freely given us salvation. What did you see in us that we poor and diseased, despised sinners should be clothed in your bright glory? That we, groaning and weeping, dying, should be as full of joy as our hearts can hold? Who can fathom immeasurable love? As far as the rational soul exceeds the senses, so does the spirit exceed the ra rational in its knowledge of you. We marvel that the finite can know the infinite, here a little, but afterwards in fullness of truth. Now we know but a small portion of what we shall know, here in part, there in perfection, here a glimpse, there a glory. To enjoy you is life eternal, and to enjoy is to know you. Keep us in the freedom of experiencing your salvation continually. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we uh, prepare to respond to God's word. We do this through our singing, through the giving back of our finances, and through the Lord's Supper. And really here at the table, uh, this is truly a family moment. This is a moment when all of God's children gather together around the family table and we partake of the wine and the bread to remember the suffering, the death, the resurrection to eternal life that our big brother Jesus secured for us. Here as we declare that we are part of this family with God as our father, here we declare the unity with Christ, the unity with one another, the solidarity with each other. So one of the things I'd like us to do is uh, we're actually going to take communion together because how could we not after speaking about this? Uh, so if you guys wouldn't mind just taking a few minutes in, in gathering uh, the elements and then um, after a few moments, we'll take the Lord's Supper together as a church family. Almost done, buddy. 
I think uh, most people have the elements now. Resolve Church, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night that he died, he took bread, he broke it and gave thanks to the Father. And he spoke to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. So Resolve Church, take and eat. As he took the cup, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you. So Resolve Church, let us take and drink. Go ahead and sing a couple more songs. <laughs>